Hola, hola. Hola, Ime. Hola, Felipe. Hi, Felipe. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm very good. Should we do this in English or Spanish? Uh, <laughs> or Spanish. Even better. Spanish, yes. We can improvise. We can do it in Spanish. How are you doing? So, uh, thank you so much, Felipe, with, for being with us. So, for those of you that don't know about it, uh, Felipe is currently showing one of his uh, beautiful flags in uh, the facade of America Society, uh, Estrella Distante. So we're here today to talk about uh, his practice in general and specifically about this series of work and the whole many beautiful iterations he has had over the years in different exhibition spaces, but also in, you know, in different, uh, uh, you know, venues and, and sites and different types of sites. Uh, and also, I do want to highlight and celebrate that Felipe is talking to us from Mexico, where he's about to open an amazing exhibition. Maybe you can tell people about it so our friends in Mexico can go see it. Sure. Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm right now uh, in Mexico City, uh, but the exhibition is in Cuernavaca in a space called La Tallera, which uh, is part of the Sala, Art, Sala de Arte Público Siqueiros which is the museum and foundation that is in charge of the legacy and the, you know, and research and archive of David Alfaro Siqueiros, the muralist. Mm -hmm. And the interesting uh, aspect of La Tallera is that it was his last residence and also studio space and also functioned sort of as a school too in Cuernavaca. It was basically, it's, it, it, it's a huge uh, sort of uh, industrial uh, space that he adapted to his needs. Uh, and there's, it, it's right next to a little house. And this complex was also um, renovated in 2010 or 12, around those years, I'm not exactly sure, but around the, that time, uh, uh, with a proposal and project by Frida Escobar, uh, Mexican architect. architect. And, and it's a great, it, it's an amazing, beautiful complex. And the idea, the invitation, uh, came up last year from first uh, spending time in the house, which is a former house where uh, Siqueiros lived. And it's now, it, for a few years, it has been working as a residency program. You know, uh, they invite artists to spend some time and to research and also to hopefully react to the site and propose a project and uh, most probably do something, you know, in, in the exhibition space. So this is basically uh, how it uh, happened with me also. Also, everything a little bit more confusing maybe because of the pandemic too you know there was a lot of uh, bureaucratic and budget issues but we finally managed to do it and uh, and yes yeah, so I spent first three weeks last year um, uh, researching mm -hmm. learning from the site and then uh, I proposed um, a project and which is what we're working on now and then I can explain more about the project once we get because I think we're going to start reviewing images and um, I think it's better I go into the detail, details of the show when we see the images. Absolutely. So yeah. why don't you tell our audience a little bit about this first image, which, if I understand correctly, is the first work you ever did in, in this line of thought. Yes. Uh, so just as a super general introduction, I, 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 I come from Chile, but I've been living in New York for about 22 years now. And I studied art in Chile um, in the Universidad Católica in the 90s, uh, which is sort of the you know, the early years of the new democracy after the uh, Pinochet dictatorship. And um, it was a very sort of vibrant time. A lot of artists run spaces, new projects, new spaces opening up, uh, you know, with a lot of uh, um, fragility too. You know, I'm not saying that it was amazing, but it, there was a lot of sort of uh, positive energy in those years. Mm -hmm. like, like a lot of energy and... and intention to do interesting projects and this first project this first slide sorry is about a it's it's the first curtain i call them curtains and i'll explain a little bit later why i call them curtains mm -hmm. and not flags or banners which but now you know of course there's an exception and i did a flag for american society mm -hmm. um but this first curtain was uh was made uh for this space called uh, galeria metropolitana which is one of these uh sort of new independent artist-run spaces uh, or independent spaces that popped up in the 90s and it's run by um, and it's still functioning by and run by Ana Maria Saavedra and uh, Zapayo who uh, 
uh, who's um, his that's his nickname. Everyone knows him as Sapayo, mm -hmm. and it's in, it's in a in a working class neighborhood of Santiago, and they sort of built this uh, this garage looking space next to the home, and which follows this uh, sort of economy of the neighborhood where people you know if they want to open a hair salon they extend their home a little kiosk or little uh deli you know it's it's sort of a way people uh live and work in this neighborhood and so they created this art space and here i was um sort of uh, experimenting not sort of but i was experimenting with video work and with sound and and i, I we needed to make this space a little bit darker you know more obscure and i sort of thought that uh, i didn't want to become a video artist all of a sudden. You know, I knew I was experimenting, it was a phase, it was, you know, an exploration. And I, I, I felt that putting a black curtain was sort of too formal and too serious. So I decided to do this geometric uh, colorful curtain. And I've been working with geometric abstraction for, you know, even many years from art school, you know, much mm -hmm. way before this, this was in 2006. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been already showing for about 10 years or more in Santiago and in different, and also a little bit of experience abroad. And, but this was the first fabric curtain work. And I was okay. immediately impressed by the, the potential of, of the material, uh, you know, in terms of scale, it's, it's very economic, you know, it, it, you know you, it's easy and cheap to produce, but also conceptually it's, it's folded, you know, and it opens up and it, it can occupy space in a very, sort of determined way, but also in a very fragile and, and poetic way, which I found uh, beautiful from the beginning. You know, it, it moves with the wind or the breeze. It can be transparent. Uh, the colors light up if there's a little bit of light or sunlight, you know, even more. So I, I sort of, this was sort of a, an eureka moment uh, or, uh, where I, I yeah, realized it, it had a lot of potential. So this was the first curtain and it for, made for that exhibition. And with can I ask you something, Felipe? I don't know the space, so maybe uh, you can explain here at the audience. Um, did um, people have to walk through it to enter the exhibition space where they would see other work? Yes, exactly. So if we, we see the first slide, that's a view from the exterior, and then people exactly have to go through it, uh, through a slit that's in the middle. And this also was interesting for me as a as a very simple gesture and of and a, a very sort of simple and and um, mm -hmm. direct way of creating this permeable uh, architecture uh, mm -hmm. or, or fragile architecture or, um, you know, there's many ways to describe it. Uh, but that was, yeah, so you have to walk through it and then you go into the exhibition space where there was sort of an installation with these wood panels and video and sound. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first um, curtain. And then why I call them curtains is because, and, and this wasn't also immediate. I, it took me a few years to come to decide how I will call them or, you know, define them. And at the beginning, I had this name, it was like wall curtain, walls, temporary walls, curtains. And I ended up sticking with curtains because uh, from the beginning, for example, that first slide we saw, I produced with the help, I hired a seamstress in Chile, in Santiago, somebody I knew from years. Uh, uh, her sister used to work at my mother's house, you know, come once in a while to clean up, you know, once a week or something like this. And... And so from the beginning, the work was also very open to integrate and to uh, uh, sort of learn from the knowledge of others, in this case, a seamstress. Uh, and then I also work with uh, my ex-partner, Joanna, who also had, a, uh, she's also an artist. We moved together to New York, but she has a lot of, or at that point, she had much more experience than I in, with textiles. So she also mm -hmm. helped me with a few projects. And the name Curtain or title Curtain has to do with this idea of bringing the work or the discussion about the work um, back to the domestic, back to the, the domesticity of how it's produced. You know, it could be made on a table uh, with on with a sewing machine. You don't need uh, complicated um, production tools or space or space. Um, so in that sense, the title curtain for me it works perfect because it it brings this notion of of the domestic into into how the work is made. And then the second image, uh, it's an exhibition at uh, Proyecto Sultra Violeta, which is an, also an artist-run space in uh, Guatemala, Guatemala City. And they, and this is 2013, so we skipped a few years. And here, uh, the exhibition space, and this is also important, I think, in terms of, uh, you mentioned at the beginning that I have exhibited in different kind of spaces, um, you know, 
in size and spirit and and from the beginning also and because this is also related to my history in Chile that I was very sort of uh, immersed in the artist run sort of uh, philosophy and 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 mm -hmm. and way of getting things done you know so through the artist run I had an artist run space in Chile called Galeria Chilena in the 90s with two friends from art school Diego Fernandez and Jovia Blanca and with them, we also, through them and through that project, with them and through that project, we got to know other artists on spaces. And this is one example, um, Ultravileta. And here, the, it's a, just a very simple gesture of exhibiting the work inside the exhibition space, which is this very colorful, you know, uh, completely anti-white cube space. And then outdoors in the mall, uh, which mm -hmm. was the first image. Um, this next slide is interesting or important for me because it shows also the interactiveness of the work. Uh, this is an exhibition, it's a group show uh, in in a space in Italy and here the, the invitation was to do something outdoors in the entrance of the exhibition space and I decided to do this, this curtain that was sort of split in four pieces. Uh, so the public was invited to interact and to move them and to play around with different configurations. Um, of the work of the installation, and this is this sort of this interaction of, with the public uh, goes sort of hand by hand with the this basic idea that the work is trying to be as open as possible with space, with the elements of space. For example, the breeze, how it moves, how it uh, sort of behaves, or even I call it sometimes dances in space uh, with the public, how the public interacts with it, can sometimes move the piece, physically touch it and move it, and in other occasions also. Um, with institution, you know, there's a dialogue with the great old institution, how, where we place it, uh, how we place them. And I think most importantly, uh, uh, with the producers, with the fabricators, yeah. because slowly the, the projects, and we'll see this along we, you know, as we move on, um, more and more I started uh, introducing or sort of uh, asking the producers to 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 participate more actively in the fabrication. And this could be in the techniques they uh, they proposed, or for example, if we do embroidery, the, the kind of stitch we use, the thickness of the line, and even color combinations. So the work opens up to, you know, to even aesthetic decisions by the fabricator. So in this, in this stage, the image we're looking now, I was still deciding the color combinations, you know, the background, the figure, but later on, the, the project opens up, and I, I involve the fabricators in, in, in working with me. And sometimes they do it by themselves, uh, pr uh, you know, for example, color combinations. I think it's very interesting also that obviously, I mean, your work um, has a, this formal relation with constructivism, right? Um, mm -hmm. With like the early avant garde, I hope, of like abstraction and constructivism, and how that relates with the idea of collectivity that you're bringing up by talking about how also. You involve the fabricators in some of the creative and artistic decisions. Um, I mean, which is something that was also the natural like detour of constructivism back at the early 20th century. Uh, yes. I mean, it was like the idea of like industrial, um, you know, and the Bauhaus, right? Like the Bauhaus, for example, which was like, you know, like, like, like going beyond the traditional boundaries of art and and, and craftsmanship and industry, but also like this idea of collective production. Anyway, I'm going to leave that as a possible reference for the audience. I mean, just to share something that your work reminds me of. Um, and, and I think it's, a, it's very interesting how the, the tour is yep. the same. No, of course, the work has all, all those uh, references. And that's basically the education I received uh, or that I sort of chose to work with in, in Chile or in art school. Mm -hmm was exactly the, you know, the Russian avant-garde, Bauhaus, all the constructive movements of Europe, and also how all this history and information also moved to the Americas. It was sort of, I migrated to the Americas and then how it was also adapted, modified, um, sort of recontextualized uh, and rethought in different cities like Buenos Aires or Sao Paulo or Rio or in, you know, in Venezuela with the, with the uh, public artworks, for example, by mm -hmm. Cruz Diez and so on. Uh, or even in Mexico here, and uh, with, for example, Matias Geritz. Um, uh, but what's interesting for me, and what's it's something that I'm learning and incorporating in the in the last maybe five or uh, yeah six years, well maybe ten, I can say, 
is uh, that's also there's, there's another knowledge uh, that's more hidden, which is the knowledge of uh, the you know not only the craft people or the craftsmen that that work with me. Um, and mostly women, I have to say, craft women, but a, a few men also have been involved in the projects. Uh, but there's also this whole history of, for example, uh, indigenous uh, knowledge of of abstraction, of color, of of um, of, for example, textile uh, knowledge. That I've, that's something I'm working on uh, with now here in Mexico. So. There's this sort of formal history that we that the work is based on, which is this what you exactly mentioned before, and then this, the work has also been incorporated in this other history and other knowledges, which we'll see as we move on. Uh, we can maybe skip to the ne next slide. Yeah. And so the work also, uh, you know, it can it can behave in different ways, and you know, it can become architecture, or permeable architecture. It can create spaces within a space. Um, if you put it in the center of the space, and you can create this sort of, uh, yeah, uh, you know, walkable uh, curtain walls. Um, if you put it in front of a curtain, or sorry, in front of a window, then the work sort of kind of behaves as a real curtain. Or if you place the work in, in front of a wall, then it can kind of behave as a painting. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the work is very flexible. And this is also something that I sort of started paying attention and noticing and learning from, from the work. It's important to me that I learned that the work was sort of teaching me things as we went along together, you know, the, the, the mm -hmm. pieces. And, this, and the, every time where I install it, you know, new things happen. And in this case, this is a residency in Guatemala in a, in a space called uh, Concepcion 41 in Antigua. And it was a short residency, about three weeks. And, and here I collaborated with a, a woman, Olga, uh, from that town. And she's, she was an expert in dyeing with indigo, which is a traditional way of dyeing in Guatemala, dyeing fabric. It's very important also in, in their textile uh, sort of history and, and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And she's sort of recuperating this, 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 uh, this, yeah, this whole history and, and tradition. And mm -hmm. so I asked her to dye uh, six different curtains uh, in, with different sort of gradations of indigo, we, which you see in the background, there's a white one. So that one was like uh, zero. And then there's one, two, three, until six different intensities mm -hmm. of indigo. And then that was one part of the project. And then the second part was that I met a, a, a Mayan woman in a market who, who was a weaver and, and also did embroidery. And I... Um, Ask her to, you know, if I could, if she was interested, I will hire her to do uh, embroidery. So sadly, the images don't show that this too much, but each curtain was dyed with indigo, and then there's lines that are embroidered, and then there's also, also cutouts, which was sort of a phase also I went through, like with the smaller scale works, trying, uh, you know, to create shapes, sort of these windows through the curtains. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the interaction with the, with the outdoors, you know, the, the shadows, the light, the trees, the vegetation. And this is also something that uh, the work wasn't afraid of, you know, it could be installed in a white cube, in a museum, in a gallery, but also it could function outdoors and, and interact with nature and with the elements. There's something very beautiful about that also, um, mm -hmm. which I think that we are so used to think about abstraction and nature as distinct la uh, visual languages yeah. that don't mix up traditionally in visual culture and in art discourse, you know, you have the, tra the tradition of like, like the landscape, you know, and especially like a tropical luscious landscape is the ultimate like backdrop for representation of painting, you know, and yeah. for like, like the whole history of like, like the domination of nature through <laughs> representation, you know, that's yeah, exactly. the genre of landscape. And like abstraction in a way was a way to avoid that and to break that and the put that you're putting both of them, the fact that you're putting them together great, you know, uh, these like amazing, you know, images, you know, that I haven't had the chance to experience live, which I imagine would be amazing because you also have the smell and, you know, and the humidity of the space or whatever, all these like other stimuli that affects the way that you are experiencing, like the, the, the height in which the, the, the corners are hung also affects the way in which you experiment them. But like all these different like stimuli that you get in such a non-traditional viewing context like it is, you know, like this garden or forest or whatever it is. I think that's quite fascinating. Um, there's something very interesting 
new proposal to to put the two of them in contrast and relation. Uh, uh, I don't know. Did you feel that was something that you were looking for, or no? It was something that. Um, or have I? I don't know. Maybe it happened by chance. No, no, no. It was something that you know when the invita this invitation happened. Uh, um, it was uh, an invitation for me, and again for Johanna, my my former partner. We used mm -hmm. to collaborate a lot, and the invitation that we always knew it was a project. To, you know, we the idea was to create a project uh, locally. And the exhibition space was this uh, green cube, this sort of wild green open cube. And we knew it from the beginning. And uh, it, yeah, of course, sometimes that this can be a challenge. But I think, uh, you know, as I said before, the as when I installed the work outdoors and I, I sort of, well, I had the experience, a few experiences uh, before, but it was, as you mentioned, it was really interesting to see these abstract works placed in this sort of really uh, like strong, Latin American um, uh, landscape. You know, this is Antigua, Guatemala. It's like this, it's surrounded by volcanoes. It's humid, it rains, there's sunlight, uh, you know, and then it's clouded and, you know, and then it rains again. And so to be uh, sort of open to the elements and to nature was something that I, I you know, I, I was surprised of how well this dialogue, uh, you know, happened. And, and, and I also felt the pieces and myself, were, we were learning from these experiences of how uh, the curtains could behave in different ways, which uh, is something that we're gonna see along also as we move along, because uh, for example, uh, well, this is a different project, but uh, we'll go back to the out, sort of outdoors, indoors in a few, in a few minutes. And this is a project uh, which you can see is a very large scale project, which this is also, I think it's interesting of the curtains that it's, it's open to, to, to a small scale, you know, for example, those measure maybe uh, a meter and 40 centimeters by 80. Uh, those were done in collaboration with uh, people that I met in Guatemala, but I also, that size, I can perfectly do myself at home and I can embroider. And if it's an exhibition, for example, in a small gallery, I can perfectly produce the pieces myself. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other projects like this one, which is for the Bienal de Sao Paulo in 2016, where you know it's a lot much larger scale uh, it there's a dialogue with this iconic uh you know building the pavilion the, the Vinal de sao paulo uh, and the invitation uh, by Jochen Bolz, the curator that i work with was to uh, think of the curtains of how they could interact not only with a specific area of the building but with the whole building uh yeah. with the whole and it was an amazing sort of uh, challenge and and the invitation was also to collaborate with uh, local studios, which I had a couple of experiences before. Like, as I said, the, the work slowly started opening up and I wouldn't uh, necessarily work with uh, the same stress in Chile anymore or with Johanna at home. Uh, I, would also, I also started collaborating with different studios and different uh, artisans and, and craftsmen or craftswomen and, and in the sites of where the exhibition was happening or produced. So, in this case, uh, I, you know, I was I I interviewed or I met a few studios, and I finally chose to work with two different teams. Uh, mm -hmm. One team uh, was these two uh, young designers um, that had a studio, a sort of a collective, cooperative, uh, like design architect artist studio in the center of Sao Paulo, and those curtains are basically was fabric mm -hmm. on fabric, uh, sort of a I call it like a collage of fabric, and and then the other group of of women was it was a group of women uh, who have a cooperative of embroiderers and the association the bordaderas do jardin Concesao. and this is in the outskirts of sao paulo in a in a in sort of a suburb of sao paulo a more popular neighborhood where these women a few years before i met them uh started collaborating and started uh, they started working together under this cooperative um you know, was, which also changed their life. You know, what some of them used to be simply housewives or janitors or, you know, or they had this, um, these jobs that were not um, well paid or fulfilling. And then and through this cooperative embroidery, they really got to sort of meet each other, learn a new, uh, learn techniques mm -hmm. uh, and be creative. And, and it, bas it really changed their lives. And they were so happy with and so active with this cooperative and they engage really well with the project too and and so the curtains were made with these two teams 
sadly because of time i didn't i you know if somebody wants to go to my website uh, i i always show images of the work and then the people that work with me so if somebody wants to check my website you can see you know the different sites and people that i've worked with and with me in different projects and here uh, the first image we saw was uh, 15 curtains in the first floor in the terrao terrao and then 15 other curtains were spread around the building interact with, in this case for example with the window again you mm -hmm. could they will hang on cables so you could move them and then uh, others were for example in 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 the space that was meant to do workshops and have uh, talks it was uh, managed run by the education department of the of the Benal. Uh, and those had like a more uh, they were very functional because they could divide the space and then you had sort of two workspace or they could open up and then you had like one large space and this was the invitation uh, and it was uh, yeah, I think this is one of the most, uh, or it's probably the most uh, large-scale project or the largest in scale that I've I've worked on until now. Mm -hmm. And here was also, um, I I think I have to mention that all these projects, you know, the designs, the the all these geometric uh, figures you see. They all come from drawings and designs that I, that I produce that I, for example, here I work with two notebooks and there's always a set of rules. There's rules, for example, okay, I'm going to divide this rectangle in four or five. And then I play around with different combinations of triangles of shapes that come, come out with of these divisions. I basically, I basically set up a grid, you know, and the grid allows me to um, play with forms. And then, but since 2013, I don't necessarily choose the colors of these grids or these shapes. I leave them open. I basically work with one color or, you know, less linear. Uh, and then as we produce the works, the color combinations I decided. In, uh, here the, the, the embroiderers and the other two designers were actively involved in designing color combinations. And also, for example, as I mentioned before, the kind of stitch we did and the thickness and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and this is another outdoor project for a residency in Norway, which it was a very short project. You know, for example, Sao Paulo took uh, the whole project, maybe a year producing it, took a whole month and a half. In Stalin, it took another month. And this is a one week project. So I'm also, the work is very flexible. It can adapt to these time frames, to these different spaces. Uh, and this was a week. This was a project that was produced in just one week. I worked with two women from a, what they call in Norway an integration school, which is a school for immigrants. So it was this woman, one from Palestine and one from um, Faisal and Habria, one from Palestine and one from Syria, and we basically embroidered together. I want to uh, make sure, uh, Felipe. While we talk, I'm seeing the rest of this slideshow, and I want to make sure that we get. Also yeah. to discuss a few specific projects, so maybe. Um... Yeah, you can you can skip. Just want to say one thing of these these. Yeah, of course. Uh, for me, it's beautiful. One one. It's beautiful that how the works interact with the shadows of the trees and you yes. know and the sun and and so the drawing the abstract drawing sort of comes uh, almost invisible or in a second place in in relation to to its environment or to its surrounding. Yes. And also because you have lines here more than instead of like having more like yeah. in the previous ones, you work more with um, surfaces, like adjacent yeah. surfaces or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the mm -hmm. more linear work, the more but, linear work also happened in, in relation to the embroidery, to the, to the integration of embroidery as of a course. technique. And this is a good example. You can see there's a sort of a, a far view and then the a detail of the embroidery so you know from mm -hmm. far it, it looks or oh, maybe somebody painted this but then when you get closer you see all the handwork and it's not one line it's not just one sort of line of stitches it's two or maybe three or maybe four uh, and then you can see sort of the energy of the of the fabricator uh, behind the you know when you get close uh, we can go to the next image maybe we uh, can if i might suggest felipe we can uh, quickly go through the different sites and you can mention where these were made. Uh, yes. So we arrived to the PAM uh, exhibition, which okay. I think has a lot of process. Yes. This one is uh, Mexico also, and here I collaborated with, uh, for the Vinal Femsa 2018, and here I collaborated with two uh, artisans from the Huichol people, uh, uh, Marcos and, 
and Lucia. And their culture is very psychedelic. So uh, it's psychedelic in the sense that, uh, well, that imaginary. Yeah. the imagery, the use of color, because their ceremonies are always through the use of peyote. So mm -hmm. I, uh, the way they design and create and work with color, mm -hmm. it, there's always two, three lines of colors to define a cactus or a wolf or, or, or any shape or figure. And so I asked them to use this sort of three or four linear gradation of color in the curtains. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And then this is just another example of, uh, it is, is in Sweden and here we couldn't find a studio to collaborate with. So the curator proposed, we did an open workshop. So these were produced in the exhibition space, inviting people to come and to embroider. And, and it, was, it was beautiful because it was different ages older women, younger women, and they all learn from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what uh, Republica Dominicana. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, yeah, also outdoor pieces and in dialogue with architecture, uh, which we can see here. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this vernacular architecture that people create, people, the owners of mm -hmm. these places, they decorate and paint their houses. So I created a dialogue between the works and the houses. This is Nicaragua. This is a project also in Nicaragua Solentiname in a residency. Um, where also I've been starting to document the work as a way to see, to document, uh, also to show how the works interact with either architecture or with the landscape. Mm -hmm. And this is the PAM project, which is uh, a recent, also large size project, which was, uh, it basically opened last year in May and it closed this year also in May. So I was very lucky that it lasts the whole year. And here I collaborated with Kadilla Cypress, who's a Mekosuki Native American uh, artisan. And in the Mekosuki culture um, and tradition, uh, as also with the Seminole, which is sort of a brother-sister tribe, uh, from, also from Florida, they uh, basically all their uh, textile tradition is based in, on uh, patchwork. And the patchwork is, it's a, it's a, sort of a horizontal of sort of a linear uh, fabric design where they abstract elements of nature, mostly. Not always, but mostly they come from the Everglades, from the surroundings, from the elements of that compose the Everglades. So for example, there's lightning, fire, uh, uh, telephone post, uh, crocodile skin, a frog. You know, there's all these names that, uh, def that define each patchwork and the patchwork is an abstraction of that, of that reference. And here we decided to, uh, we, well, we found we were introduced to, to Kadilla for another um, artist from the Mikosuki people who's uh, Houston Cypress, who's also a poet and an activist. And, and basically there, there was a very interesting conversation and dialogue between how we could um, integrate or how we could join our experiences and our knowledges. In my case, you know, I come from this sort of uh, more, um, you know, quote unquote, Western, as we mentioned before, uh, tradition of art where we were taught, where I was taught, you know, the avant-garde, Bauhaus and so on, and this sort of uh, European centric and North American centric uh, uh, history of abstraction. And then how we could make the dialogue with the history of the Native American uh, history of abstraction. Also, no, I don't, sorry, I don't want to repeat history, but um, you know, uh, at the end, each each curtain, each panel, each surface becomes a sort of a, a surface where, and a point where these two histories uh, dialogue, uh, interact, and also create something new that none of them could, could have created uh, on themselves mm -hmm. or by themselves. And I worked on this project with Jennifer Ignacio, uh, who's an adjunct curator at PAM. And from the beginning also, there was this discussion or idea of to work not only indoors, but also outdoors. Uh, and this is also because the building, it's, it, it has a, the way it was designed, uh, the surrounding of the, of the museum is a, it's a very interesting melting point of public space basically in Miami, which is a city that doesn't have many public spaces in terms of parks and recreational spaces like New York City. Mm -hmm. So we decided to hang works outdoors and also indoors. Um, and yeah, there's 20, it was 24 curtains that, that we ended up uh, mm -hmm. uh, installing. Uh, again, some of them, there's different ways of hanging the curtains. Uh, it could, they could be hung with cables 
or they could also on against the wall or or crossing over a room you know from one side to the other when they hang on cables the idea is that the people the the public sorry can in uh, interact and move them actually touch them and move them and sort of rearrange the space you know uh, forever <laughs> and then the other works are hung uh, uh, by one point uh, with a simple cotton twine and and those interact by themselves with the air circulation with space or somebody walks by you know they're slowly spinning so there's there's elements of the works that are impossible to show in the images you have to experience it you have to see it uh, be there in space um, but these are basic, yeah. these are the two these are the two basic ways or main ways I've found uh, to install the pieces and then we can move on to the other slides uh, this is a very beautiful image I find because uh, this was an encounter we made a sort, sort of a special meeting for Khadija and for her family members and her, her sisters came her brothers friends and, mm -hmm. and you know other people from the community and you can see how they uh, you know this is the way they dress they apply patchworks to the skirts or to, to the to you know sometimes even to uh, t-shirts and sweaters and there's also that's also interesting about the patchwork that it you have a very traditional sort of style of patchwork which uh, the most traditional one is the medicine man uh, color combination which is white red uh, black and yellow and then this is the only like real like the most traditional one and you cannot change those colors and it has a you know sort of a specific design but then other than that all the other patchworks you can use different color combinations and they also integrate like modern fabrics so you can find patchwork that is uh, sort of sewn over like a t-shirt of or pokemon or, or superman or batman you know and this is also a beautiful interaction between you know contemporary culture and traditional yeah. culture and so they came with the more traditional clothes in this occasion and you can see how the patchwork is applied on their dresses and also how it's used uh, in the or how it behaves in the in the curtains uh, which is also you know uh, it's, it's something that happens with all sort of most of my projects that there's a basically I incorporate these traditional techniques and we sort of give them a spin and it's 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 a way to for the fabricators also to sort of, I learn from them a lot. And, they, and I also hope they learn from me of how their techniques and how their knowledge can also be applied in relation to space, architecture, interaction, in, you know, involvement of the public. And, you know, here they move in the curtains, they're playing with them. Um, yeah. And that's, that's a PAM project. It, it, was, it was a very you know compact. strong project and compact yeah, and, and it was as interesting for me as also I think for the Miko School community because they also I think it's the first time they like in this scale and this manner collaborated with an art institution in Miami and mm -hmm. it was also a way to get to for them to share their culture to we did a couple of there was a public program we did a couple of events where I, I asked them to organize the events and to propose subjects that they were interested in, in talking about uh, so it was also a way to uh, sort of use the institution, the Paris Art Museum, as a platform for them, for that, for that, to because there's people in, that live in Miami for 20 years or 30 and have never been to the Mikosuki Reservation. They don't know much about them. You know, they're still uh, very isolated. And this was, a, it, I think, it, for them, it was very uh, interesting and rewarding to use this like huge platform and and for me and to create together something new. I have a question for you with regards to that and with regards, um, you know, uh, again, going back to the origin of this, which was your, your research into the languages of abstraction and the utopian possibilities of abstraction. Um, to contextualize my question, I'm gonna like talk about like something that happened to two artists, Argentine artists in New York in the 70s that are in our current show. And that's why this reminded me of them, mm -hmm. which is um, Cesar Paternoso and Alejandro Puente who were working with minimal art and very interested in languages of abstraction through their involvement with like, like you know, the avant-garde that you named before, you know, in the case of one like from Argentina, blah, blah, blah. So they moved to New York, you know, like very interested in modern art and in abstraction in this like European tradition of abstraction that they had like inherited. And they um, go to see a show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art 
that was on the um, an exhibition of um, uh, the collection that uh, one of the Rockefeller brothers had set up of so-called primitive art that had, you know, indigenous art from like all over the continents, you know, like Oceanic art, like um, African art and American art. It's the current, is the basis for the current department of like the um, arts of Asia, uh, Americas and Oceania at the Met. Anyway, when they go see that show, they have this kind of like Eureka moment or revelation moment in which they notice in Inca works and in Inca textile patterns, a lot of abstract art. And they're like, how come it is that we've been like forever thinking about the origins of abstraction and looking at like the constructivists or the cubists or this and that without paying attention to all these like abstract references that we had in our ancient cultures in the Americas. And they, you know, Cesar Paternoso then goes to research these in books that he writes um, Alejandro Puente into his artwork also. I mean, I know this is a total detour, but I want to come back to this because I think what you're doing is uh, somehow related to that type of experience, but through a much more interesting way, which is that you started doing like your own abstractions, right? You took them to a format that was a curtains or flag or whatever, but you still need to explain us why it's called curtains, like just a note on that. Um, and then, but you took the abstraction, you know, you went to the curtains and just because you were working with, uh, you know, um, with embroidery, you started working with uh, artisans and you arrived to work with indigenous artisans and it's contemporary indigenous artisans and you are working, you know, with compositions that they suggest to you that come from their visual cultures that we don't know so much about. So it's super interesting because it's a very similar or parallel process to the one that I'm telling you about. But at the same time, yours has like the much more shaming experience of like working with people that work with these visual partners in their everyday life. But I don't know. I mean, um, I thought it was an interesting parallel and I don't know what you think about it. No, no, completely, yeah. And and this uh, basically has to do with, with uh, the history of colonization. You know, it's like we, we are, you know, it come, at least my experience from Chile is like we look to Europe, we look to the U.S. Like it, when I, as an art young young art student, you know, we all want to go to New York, we all want to go to London or to Paris, and why not go to Lima or to Buenos Aires or to uh, Rio? You know, why not? Which is something that I slowly started learning or sort of realizing once I moved to New York, mm -hmm. because I started to get to know. And this is also that there can be a parallel with the exhibition now at the American Society. This, that there's still a very strong community of artists from Latin America in New York, and you get to know people from all over. And then uh, even before this experience and with this experience, you know, I started traveling uh, much more to Latin America. And so I started going to Mexico, to uh, Brazil, to Rio, to Sao Paulo, to Buenos Aires, to Guatemala, uh, Nicaragua. And so, so I started learning through the experience of actually traveling and being in these places from New York more than from Chile. And, and yeah, and, and then slowly the project started, you know, of course I would go to a textile museum because I was interested in textile. And then as the artist you mentioned, I would be blown away by the use of abstraction by the Incas or by the use of color and sort of this psychedelic use of color, as I mentioned by the Huicholes in, in Mexico, in Zacatecas. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, this is something that uh, that I hope the project is slowly being uh, more aware of. My my work is being more and more aware of, and finding new ways to to work with this sort of uh, you know the clash between these two histories or, or, or systems of knowledge. Uh, and I think at the end, each curtain is is trying to do that. Is trying to to combine. You know, of course, it's not always fifty fifty, or it's not always. Um, uh, one or the other, but it, it's. I try to 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 focus on this aspect of how the curtains can bring this so this hidden, forgotten, displaced histories uh, into the work. And you know, from my experience, I cannot also uh, sort of forget or renegade where I come from. I studied the Bauhaus. I studied the avant-garde. I studied all this. Of course. Uh, and, and this is a sort of a, sort of my backbone and. Uh, or, yeah, it's so the curtains are trying yeah, to do yeah. this, and and 
And yeah, and it's in, it, for me, it's kind of beautiful because it happens in each curtain, but then there's a dialogue between the curtains. There's a dialogue with the curtains and the space, and then they can also go outdoors. Uh, or the, in this case, in the photo we're looking at, there's a dialogue between the curtain and the skirt that this uh, Mikusuki uh, woman is wearing. You know, so there's all these um, sort of confrontations mm -hmm. and conversations. That's amazing. Um, anyway, um, why don't we go see, may I suggest, because we have 15 minutes before they lock us out of Instagram. Okay. <laughs> But uh, let's go comment on the one uh, that we are showing, which is the next slide. And maybe you can tell uh, our audience a little bit about it. Of course, uh, this is this is the exhibition. Uh, oh, well, this is the, okay, now we can talk about the curtain versus flag. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly, sort of please. <laughs> yeah, before we go into the, the exhibition that I'm working on now, that is opening this Saturday at La Tallera please. in Cuernavaca. Um, now we're looking at the at the flag project, uh, which is part of the flag series at the American Society that I produced last year, at the end of last year. I, think, I believe it was like fall, September, October, and November. And then we did a second version in January, February, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, basically a lot of people immediately call my pieces flags, but I sort of, I, I, I avoid that term. Um, even I did this flag with American Society because it's used in a flag post, it's on the street, it's the whole concept is to create flags uh, that are mm -hmm. great flags. Uh, but in my case, and I feel more comfortable with the definition, definition of curtain because for me flag, it, it has this sort of uh, very determined and sort of obvious political connotation or relation to politics mm -hmm. and to territory and to ideology. And in my case, what I'm trying to do, I think from even the very early days of art school and then later you know my early my first shows and then how the flag oh, the, sorry the flag the curtain project has evolved is to expand the formal into the social and this expanding on the formal to the social that maybe now we can add, add another layer of history to the formal into the social and into history um, is that um, the, the, definition, the definition curtain is it's much more social for me it, it relates to as I mentioned before the domesticity of how the work is produced. It could be made with a sewing machine on a table in, a, in, you know, in your dining table, on your, in your living room, uh, whatever. Um, you don't need like a real studio to produce the work. You just need a, you know, or you, you need a little piece of floor. And, and, you know, this is sort of, I'm romanticizing it, of course, but uh, uh, curtain for me relates to this idea of it's sewing, it's folded, it's, you know, somebody embroiders it. Um, Mm -hmm. or oh, I embroider it, and I prefer that sort of discussion more than it's a flag and what f the, the term flag means. I understand, totally, totally. Yeah, totally. and then we can go move on to the, ah, and this flag specifically, sorry, this flag, because it, it was a, an actual flag, you know, and uh, and mm -hmm. and even, you know, I I tried to avoid the definition of, uh, of working with flags. Um, I I purposely uh, and intentionally work with the Mapuche flag. Uh, in, uh, Mapuche is the most important uh, native people from Chile. They mostly live in the south of Chile, also in uh, south and areas of Argentina, uh, across the Andes. And there's a flag that has been, you know, there's a, there's a flag that was very uh, sort of, um, sort of revitalized uh, in the last, mm -hmm four or five years, uh, and then there's, uh, which is the official Mapuche flag because of the mm -hmm. whole estallido social and the whole social mm -hmm. movement that happened in Chile in, uh, since October 2019. Uh, but then there's a second flag, which is not so well known, but it's, it's a beautiful, this is just a white star against the blue background. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's a star with eight points, and it's very abstract. And I, I, this is a series of drawings I did uh, based on this flag, sort of mm -hmm. deconstructing the Mapuche flag. Mm -hmm. and sort of reinterpreting it. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I can yeah, say about I, this project. And then, mm -hmm. yeah? No, 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 I think it's okay. I think um, I have it on the Google slide. I just added like the other side of the flag just to mention to people that is uh, yellow. And something interesting about the one that you did at America Society also is that uh, 
you uh, did all this doing yourself, which I yes, think is Yes, this one I did myself. Yes, and I think that's very interesting with regards to the fact that you were working, you know, with something that is so uh, embroidered with your identity, valga la redundancia of saying embroidered with your identity, you know, like uh, like the Mapuche flag, and I think that and and uh, and in this, this very important and specific political moment uh, in which Chile was deciding, I mean, there was a social revolt that led also to the decision for Chile to create a new constitution that would, yes. among other things, recognize the rights of these Mapuche communities that have always yeah, lived and, in country. And of several other indigenous uh, exactly. uh, people and nations around Chile. In the north, we have uh, uh, the uh, Aymaras, we have the Rapa Nui people in Isla de Pascua. So there's, there's uh, about mm -hmm. seven or eight, and they all have, which is also interesting and new, very new for the for the history, political history of Chile, is that uh, they finally have a, a seat at the table, sort of to say, because they they have yeah. seats, uh, positions, seventeen uh, uh, positions in the Convención Constitucional, which is the assembly that's right in the Constitution now, and also it's a, it's also an assembly that is, and I think this is the first time in in the history of the world that is. Uh, gender equal, it's 50-50 percent, and mm -hmm. and it has it has 50, 154 seats, on and 17 are for indigenous, um, uh, yeah, different communities, mm -hmm. and yeah, so the, yeah, so this is a um, yeah, it's a very important moment in the history of Chile, and it's become a little bit uh, polemical too because there's you know. Uh, it's not easy. There's a new government, a very young government in place now, and 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 the but the parliament is very split. It's very the right has a, and the more conservative uh, uh, parties in Chile have much more representation than the convention constitutional. So it's a complicated moment, but I think very interesting. Well, I mean, we're all paying a lot of attention, so it is culturally quite unique and mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, uh, I do want to suggest that uh, while you talk about La Tachera and your current project that you're about to open, uh, if anybody in the audience has any questions, please type them in into the chat. I'm going to try to include uh, them. So, but yeah, please uh, tell everybody what you're doing now in Cuernavaca. Okay, so here, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of, the, of our conversation, um, I was invited to Mexico by Willy Kaus, the curator and director of, of uh, Salarte Polis Suqueiros. And um, so I did this residency last year uh, where I basically, um, the one particular um, or particularity of La Tallera, I mean, besides being the former residence and studio and sort of uh, educational space of Siqueiros, was that he also, um, there's, a, there's two murals or three that uh, that are there that still exist, uh, you know, and they're different from his of his most well-known murals or his you know his other body of or most of his work, because these are completely geometric and abstract. They don't have any figuration, and and they're basically murals that he made and produced uh, as a way to teach his concept, which is the uh, pintura uh, polyangular or mur mu uh, polyangular muralism. And it's a very basic concept that, uh, you know, he wanted to have an, uh, well, first of all, uh, Siquiru was very interested in, in modern techniques and modern paintings in, 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 this, in the industrialization of the world and sort of this uh, sort of advanced thinking of, 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 you know, new techniques, new, new paints, new, uh, uh, yeah, new mm -hmm. ma materials to work with. And so he uh, experimented a lot with industrial paints and so on, and you know spraying the paint using different techniques. And uh, these two murals are made with these paints, and they are, um, yeah, they, 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 they these abstract rooms. And he also painted the walls, the, not only the, the walls but also all the walls, the ceiling and the floor. This is one room which is called a sala polyangular, and then outdoors there's two other murals, and. Uh, so the invitation was to sort of study, start a research about these, the history of these murals and the concept of these murals uh, and uh, the concept of polyangularia and then propose something in response. So I 
I propose I started drawing as I always do with this grid, you know, a combination of, you know, um, dividing the rectangles for one and four sides, uh, sort of uh, slots, and then playing with this grid, uh, different uh, combinations, formal combinations. And uh, what happened is that um, uh, I created a series of drawings that there's, each drawing has four versions. So like there's a drawing, it's not like another project where I make one drawing and then I make a different one and then a different one. Here, each design has four different versions as a way to think of, you know, uh, how one drawing can slightly change and, and with a minimal element become something different. And so when you're looking at the drawing, you look at another one, you look at another one, and then there's a constant change. And this was sort of the first concept of the project. And then the second concept was to work with, uh, find somebody who worked with textiles in this area uh, in Mexico. Uh, and I was recommended to get in touch with this woman called Mireya Salazar, who lives in a town called Huayapan, which is about two hours away from Cuernavaca. And she, uh, she weaves, she's a weaver, uh, but she weaves with uh, the uh, backstrap or waist loom, which is the, the pre-colonial, the indigenous uh, weaving technique. Uh, so I first uh, sort of met her and, and we had a conversation. I asked her if it was technically possible to do a, a piece of this size, which is about two meters 20 by one meter 40. And it is possible by basically sewing uh, because they can only work uh, because of its base on the on the on, on the waist and how it's it's work you know physically th this waist loom uh, they can produce maximum more or less seventy centimeters in width so we basically you know she basically attached two pieces together and this is also the way they create for example with pillars in Guatemala and and a lot of indigenous clothing is by attaching uh, two pieces of fabric uh, because it's it's the, the waist loom wouldn't, it doesn't allow to, to create um, wider pieces. And so this is one part of the project. And then I've, oh, I've been following for a long time uh, another studio uh, called uh, Taller Ocho, run by Beto Ruiz, who is based in Oaxaca. And he works with the pedal loom, uh, which is the loom that arrived with the, with the colonizers. So I thought it could be interesting to create this dialogue between the, you know, the two poles of the history of weaving in Mexico. On the one hand, we have the traditional indigenous uh, weaving technique, uh, and then we have the the pedal loom, which was brought by Europe, uh, brought from Europe. Um, and there's 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 technical differences which you can see when you get closer to the work. For example, the these white ones with the black lines. Uh, with the with the waist loom, you cannot create diagonals. You can also only integrate in the weaving uh, verticals and horizontals. Uh, th this is what um, Mireya told me. So we decided that she will create the backgrounds first. You know, she will weave the background, and then the lines will be hand embroidered, which is the first slide we saw. Like, by the way, you know, if we go back to the first slide, you can see the the drawing is uh, embroidered by hand. There's one before this one. This one. Mm. Um, so then I also decided to work mostly with black and white as a way to focus on, you know, to... And also because I've, I've been working with color for so long and, you know, the, the whole project at PAM was very colorful and it was even almost like psychedelic when you were in space. Right. Um, so I decided to sort of scale back a little bit, uh, make it more, you know, completely... Uh, you know, maybe go uh, exaggerate this idea of the of this sort of minimal or uh, abstract art. You know, black and white is super traditional, and and it also allows it. There's less elements, so I think it allows the viewer to understand the better the difference, the different take uh, between the differences between the two techniques of weaving, the two styles of weaving, the two uh, histories of weaving. Um, so the what the pieces that were made by Mireya are. The, you know, they're lighter, the, mm -hmm. the fabric is a little bit more transparent, and the lines are hand-woven, uh, sorry, hand-embroidered. And, and the other pieces, if you could, we go to another slide, uh, the next one, this one, for example, if you get closer, if it's possible, uh, it's a much thicker fabric. Uh, it's all um, uh, sheep wool, all of them, uh, both Mireya's and Beto's work. 
But this is a much thicker fabric and, and the drawing here is integrated in the weaving. You can create diagonals and, and you know, you can make these shapes uh, with the pedal uh, loop. Felipe. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I want to make sure that we tell people when this is going to be on view uh, because yes. we have only one minute left. Okay. And we might be cut down any minute by Instagram. Okay, no problem. Yeah, this is opening this Saturday in Cuernavaca. Everybody's invited and it will run until at least mid-September. And one last interesting, I think, important uh, aspect of the work is, or the project is that we decided to uh, sort of um, make a dialogue, produce a dialogue between these curtains and the whole building of La Tallera, the whole complex. So it's not only the exhibition space, it's also, for example, this hallway, there's also some hanging the, in the garden because the, this is the house of the former house of Siqueiros, which is the building that now functions as a residency for artists mm -hmm. and also some office space. So we, we place the curtains in different locations throughout the, the whole complex. Mm -hmm. And then this, these are also hanging inside, this, uh, inside the Sala Poliangular, which mm -hmm. is the space that I, I mentioned before where that Siqueiros used uh, as a way to teach his uh, theory, theory of ideas of uh, pintura poliangular. And, and that's it. And then, uh, yeah, maybe last, John, just one last thing to say is that with the, I think there's one more slide where you can see like a large, larger um, yeah. view of like the exhibition space. I think this is the last one. No, that's the last one? Okay. Well, mm -hmm. um... But so, I think this is fantastic, uh, Felipe, and thank you so much for sharing your cartoons with us. Um, I'm very happy that, uh, you know, your work uh, was part of the flag series. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that I hope that it forces you to think about the idea of, of flags in a non complicated way, but actually I created, like, adventure. I, we're super happy with the results and people love it. And if you're in New York, please come see it. I mean, it's hanging outside our building throughout the summer. So we're very happy to have it. And, um, and if you're in Cuernavaca, please go see his exhibition at La Tachera. Um, thank you so much for sharing the history of the gardens with us. And gracias no, of course. Thank you. Todos los éxitos. Gracias. Chao. Bye-bye.